Good afternoon. Today is April 10th, 2024 in the afternoon, and we're here in the historic Senate chamber of the Kansas State House in Topeka. I'm Chris Courtright, who served for 34 years working as an economist for the Kansas legislature in its nonpartisan research department before retiring in 2020. For full disclosure, Governor Kelly appointed me shortly thereafter to her bipartisan council on tax reform. Today, I'm privileged to interview former Senator Nick Jordan, who has had a long, distinguished, and diverse career in public service. In addition to serving as a Republican senator in the Kansas legislature from 1995 to 2009, representing parts of Johnson County, he served in multiple cabinet-level posts during the Brownback administration, and even ran for Congress a time or two back in the day. Prior to entering the political arena, his fascinating career in the private sector actually began as a busboy. Uh, his more than 40-year career in the travel and tourism industry saw him move into hotel management and then on to become the founding president of the nationally re renowned Overland Park Convention and Visitors Bureau. Nick's prominence in both the public and private sectors for many decades as a tireless champion for economic development throughout the state remains a key part of his legacy. Did, did I get most of that right? It's so far so good. Okay. Um, this interview with Mr. Jordan is conducted on behalf of the Kansas Oral History Project, a not-for-profit corporation created for the purpose of interviewing former legislators and significant leaders in state government, particularly those who've served since the 1960s. The interviews will be accessible to researchers, educators, and the public through the Kansas Oral History Project website, ksoralhistory.org, and also the Kansas Historical Society and the State Library. Transcriptions are made possible as a result of the generosity of KOHP donors. Former Speaker, I'm sorry, former House Speaker Pro Tem Dave Heineman is our videographer today. During your many years in the State House, uh, Mr. Jordan, I suppose it demonstrates your jack of all trades, <laughs> diverse skill set that you served on so many different committees. But looking over those records, I guess some of the highlights that should not surprise us, given what we have already said by way of introduction, were that you, of course, chaired multiple committees on economic development and commerce, vice chaired a panel on transportation and tourism, and served stints on many of the most powerful committees here in the Senate, uh, not the least of which included uh, assessment and taxation, federal and state affairs, and it looks like two uh, full four-year terms on Ways and Means. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope I cherry-picked most of the top ones since there's quite a few others on, on your full list. Yeah. Yes, I, I told everybody at the time there was a very popular Royals infielder who played outfield, he played several positions. They say I kind of became the utility player for the Senate and then that went on into the into the administration of Sam Brownback. I became kind of almost a utility player in the, in the administration, which was great. Gave me a lot of great experiences, a lot of different, uh, you know, everybody used to say it's almost like you get a PhD on a lot of topics when you serve in the legislature or you're in the cabinet. And so I got a lot of opportunities to get my PhD in a lot of different, different categories. Absolutely. And we're, we're going to cover a lot of that ground here in just a few minutes. Uh, but, but before we delve into your legislative, uh, legislative years and committee work and, and big issues and whatnot, let's, let's get into some additional background. Um, are you a native Kansan? And if not, when did your family move here? I was probably less than a month old. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and actually moved to Topeka, Kansas. I grew up here uh, until I went in the ninth grade. And then we moved to Johnson County. My dad got transferred in an insurance uh, company. And so we moved to Johnson County. So Topeka was my home. Uh, coming up here for all these sessions, I still knew my way around town pretty well. Mm -hmm. Drove by the old homestead once in a while. Uh, but most of my life was in Johnson County. We're going to get into your mid-1990s arrival into the state political scene here in Topeka shortly. Uh, but by that point in your life, you were in your 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, and had been well established with a great deal of private sector success and weren't ex exactly an eager young 20-something freshman legislator showing up here uh, ready, ready to save the world. So, so tell us a little bit about the whole very interesting busboy to hotel management to founder of the uh, OPCVB journey that you undertook prior to, to getting here in 1995. Sure. Obviously, I was looking for a job when I was 15 years old and ended up being a busboy. 
Uh, the interesting thing was I, I just, I'm so thankful for some of the journey I've been on. When I was 19, they made me a restaurant manager, uh, which was kind of a unique situation. I had a hotel manager, and at that time, there weren't very many hotel management schools in the country. So he said, hey, stick with me. I'll teach you the hotel business. But the most important thing is if you can learn people skills and travel, uh, it's going to do you really well the rest of your life. And the people skills part I, is true. And if you want to learn people skills, get in the restaurant or hotel business. Mm -hmm. You get every kind of personality. So anyway, I did that. And uh, I ended up going down being assistant director of marketing at the Mulebach Hotel, which was a nationally renowned classic hotel. Uh, had had every president since Teddy Roosevelt stay in the suite and uh, continued. And I got to deal with a lot of VIP visits and things at the hotel. Uh, then what was a, a hotel company. In the meantime, my director of sales down at the Mulebach wrote me a note and said, hey, Overland Park, Kansas is going to start a convention bureau. You really ought to apply for that. And so I applied and uh, got the position. Uh, was really privileged, had a great staff. We grew that into a multi-million dollar industry for the city of Overland Park. And in oh. fact, we're the ones that walked in and said we ought to build a convention center and started working towards having a convention center in Overland Park. Did a lot of seminars around the country about how do you brand a subur suburban location competing against the metro, big urban location. How do you do that? How do you brand it? So I did a lot of seminars on branding and marketing of a community. Uh, and it was good. That. Uh, that was 10 years of my life. Mm -hmm. I ran that bureau and grew that industry and uh, saw a lot of good things happen in Oval Park. Great experience. Through that, I was a two-term president of the Travel Industry Association of Kansas, and that leads me into the political situation a little bit. Obviously, I was up here a lot. Yeah. Uh, John Carlin was governor. Jamie Schwartz was uh, secretary of commerce. Kathy Kruzik was director of tourism. And I was up here all the time talking to them, uh, constantly talking to them. Of course, back in Overland Park, we were tax-funded convention bureau, so all the Johnson County legislators I had contact with one way or another. And I became a volunteer lobbyist for some time for the travel industry. So all of that uh, brought me a lot of different contacts, Rotary Club type things, a lot of contacts politically. Bud Burke, I'd known before I came up, and he was president of the Senate so when I came to the days, Senate. Yes. So I had all those contacts then. I, um, in between the convention bureau, though, and uh, coming and thinking about the Senate, I actually pastored, was senior pastor of a large church, 2,500 attendee on Sundays, and had a uh, school. Uh, it was a transition period, which is a long story that we don't need to go into, but that was something I did for a couple of years. Kept everything together. Everything ran smoothly. Don't, still don't know why 2,500 people wanted to hear me speak every Sunday, but they did. Uh, and that worked out. And then so when that was done, when I felt like that I'd done what I needed to do at the church, uh, I was actually laying in bed one morning and uh, my wife and I woke up and I said, you know, I think I'm supposed to go to lunch with Gus Bogina and say to him, if he ever doesn't want to run again, uh, I'd sure like to maybe have a chance of running for the Kansas Senate. So this so, was your idea? Right yeah, now. okay. It was my idea and I called Gus and we had lunch and of course we knew each other from all the other stuff I'd done. Had lunch, and it was really nice. It was kind of pat me on the head, and I said, that'd be great, Nick. You'd be a good senator. No, nothing other than that, you know? And we left. And so within days, we went to the Ozarks for the weekend, and with days after that, at about 5.30 in the morning, I started getting phone calls from Kansas City Media. And, uh, yeah, I just woke, they woke me up. And they said, uh, Gus Bogina's going to resign and take a position on the Board of Tax Appeals, and you are the leading candidate to replace him in the Kansas Senate. And so that was kind of a wow moment. Uh, it took me a couple of minutes to wake up and think about what they were saying to me. And I ran, and obviously precinct committee people were the ones to vote me in. I had two or three people run against me, one on the first ballot. And then there, from there it went. Uh, so there, there were a couple, three people in yeah, the race. ran against and, yeah. me with the, with the uh, precinct committee people. And first ballot, I won it and uh, came up to Topeka. And, been all those years here. Okay, well th this would have been the summer of 95 mm -hmm. uh, when Gus stepped down and then the precinct committee people plugged you into to his seat. Um, it seemed to me that you jumped pretty seamlessly straight into the Topeka political scene with, with both feet pretty, pretty effortlessly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to ask uh, if the public service bug had already been in your blood in any sense, that, did your family have a history in politics or anything? Not tremendously. My mom did was a poll worker 
as long as I can remember, she worked the polls and worked elections, but other than that, not really a whole lot of political background. Uh, I just, it just is in my heart. I mean, it just was something a part of me uh, through a lot of things I'd done, the, the time I'd come up here for the travel industry. Uh, I'm honestly working at the Millbach. I mean, I escorted Jimmy Carter around. I escorted a lot of people around all the time, dealt with Secret Service, I don't know how many times. I don't know, there was just a, a real desire, and plus a desire, I, you know, sometimes you just want to make a difference. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want to find a place where you can hopefully make a difference. And uh, I just wanted to do that. I wanted to try to make a difference. I'd done it with the Convention Bureau, I'd done sure. it in other areas, and so now I maybe had a chance to do something uh, in Topeka. I have to ask, did you like Jimmy Carter? He was good. I, you want a real funny story about Jimmy Absolutely. Carter? Uh, he, I was sitting in my office at the Mealbach one morning, the White House called and said, hey, Jimmy Carter, the president wants to do a national press conference at the Mealbach. Well, I didn't realize what that means. Um, he needed 100 sleeping rooms and he needed one of our <laughs> huge ballrooms. So I looked at our books and we had a full house convention booked over those dates. So I called him back and said, hey, I don't think we can do it. Make a long story short, I had to move 100 rooms out of the Mealbach wow. into other hotels. And the convention said, well, that'll be okay if he'll attend our, our convention in some way, dinner or something like that. <laughs> so then I'm back to Secret Service and everybody, you know, eh, eh. and they said, no, it absolutely isn't going to happen. Uh, lo and behold, we had to move their reception out into a foyer at the Mulebach. It was shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow reception. And lo and behold, he did. He went out in that reception, which I sure drove the Secret Service absolutely <laughs> crazy. So the next morning during the press conference, this is the core of the part of the story, I get a call from uh, his advance team saying, have you got any of those old wooden Coca-Cola bottle boxes? Remember the old wooden boxes they used? I said, well, yeah, we do. And they said, could you please put one behind the podium? For the, for the president today. Oh, yeah. So we had to run and get our box and put it behind the podium. And I, you know, I escorted him up to the press conference and everything. But yeah, you know, it was a typical thing. I, I escorted him a couple times during the campaign. And it was that thing, you know, he, he always had that deal where he carried his clothes over his shoulder, mm -hmm. wouldn't let the bellhops or anybody touch it. He had to carry yeah. it, you know, and we'd go up to the room. So anyway, uh, so I, I had a lot of little contacts with political right. stuff, being at the Mulebach in the hotel business. Bob Dole used to be at, the hotel Glenwood Manors where I was a busboy and a restaurant manager and Bob Dole was there all the time for stuff. So there was a lot of contact politically. So even before you got here, you were establishing your bipartisan bona fides then. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, tell us a little more about your first race to retain your Senate seat in, in 1996. The, the records show that you got 60% of the vote against your Democratic opponent, Janice McIntyre. From what I recall, the national and state economies were doing fairly well in the mm -hmm. mid 90s. Mm -hmm. So was this a campaign that focused more on social than economic issues? Also, um, were there debates and forums that you both attended or was the campaign fought more along the lines of radio ads, yard signs and postcards? Also, do you have any funny front porch stories to tell us about the first time you were going door to door and meeting with some of your more eccentric future constituents? I will tell you that my favorite front porch stories often seem to involve somewhat aggressive dogs. But uh, pl please tell us what you recall about your 1996 campaign. Uh, it, it was really, there were, at that time, social issues were a big thing. And, and I'm a pro-life guy. Uh, and. Um, the Shawnee at that time was very, there's St. Joseph Catholic Church, which has a huge influence on the, on the city of Shawnee. Um, and so that, that was a big issue. I'd say economic issues too, and education's always an issue when you're on a campaign trail uh, to talk about education. So there was a mixture of a lot of different things to talk about. I always felt like, and I think again, my background helped with this, I always felt like one of the best things you can do is be a part of the community, be out there doing things. And uh, I always did that. I always felt like being at the chamber, Rotary, all of that was important, even though probably some people didn't agree with me on some things, still was there. Uh, and relationships are so important. And I just, I just felt that was always important. So I thought that was a key from my very first campaign on, was that I, I was known in the community, I was active in the community, I was involved in the community. Uh, and then you did the typical campaign things. Yes, there were forums. Yes, we did the mailings and uh, all the things that we typically do in a, in a campaign. You're talking about front porch stories. Um, I had 
you know, you always have interesting conversations at front doors. And of course, nowadays, uh, sometimes you can't even get the front door answered on a campaign. So there's not as many funny stories as there used to be. But I did get bit once oh, <laughs> by yeah? a dog, uh, chased me away from the door and took a hold of my leg and gave me a little bite to let me know I shouldn't be back. <laughs> well, I hope those people voted for you. I hope so, too. They didn't answer the door. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, well, backing up a moment, prior to that 96 campaign, can you tell us what the experience was like for you when you showed up for your first legislative session in January of that year? It would have been January of 96. And maybe how you went about learning all the legislative procedures and nuances and who the key stakeholders and lobbyists were and whether some of the more senior members of the GOP caucus uh, here in the Senate helped sort of mentor you or anything. Well, as I said, Bud Burke was president when I first got up here and I knew Bud and so there was a good relationship there. And so I had a lot of, uh, I knew a lot of the Johnson County delegation as it was. So I had a lot of great mentoring opportunities from people to kind of guide me through the process. Um, but learning the rules, learning the process, and learning what you should do. I, I can't remember the time frame, Chris, but um, of course education is always a huge issue. And when I first got up here, I, I remember Bill Graves calling me up to the office and saying, Nick, what would you like this session? And at the time, we were flush with money. The state was doing really well financially. And I said, you know, it'd be great if we could reduce the mill levies. Just whatever, just reduce the mill levies. And, he actually said in his office, I agree with you, we ought to reduce the mill levies if we can. So I come down to the floor and of course the education bill comes across and mill levies weren't reduced. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and I think I'm going to be real cute now, you know, I'm going to pass on, on when it came, my name was called. So I passed. Lo and behold, when it got back to me, it was a tie. Ooh. I had to cast the, the tie breaking vote. I voted no. Uh, which all of a sudden brought me a whole bunch of thank you notes from the House side, uh, got, got me in trouble with some of my fellow Johnson <laughs> County legislators a little bit. But, long, you know, at the end of the session, we reduced two mills. Mm -hmm. uh, we did reduce two mills that year and got it done. So I only say that to say that I never passed again. I always, uh, I always said, you know, I always tell new legislators, um, find your ground, learn the issue, Find where you should be, what you believe to be the right issue, right position. Vote it. You know, it'll save you time with lobbyists coming at your door, and it'll save you a lot of headache when you get to the floor if you're just up straight and honest about where you're at. And it's an intelligent position. You've got a reason uh, for where you're at kind of thing. So if you want to know a lesson from my first freshman year, the other one, another story if you want one. I don't know how much time we got. Oh, we got, had, we have time. If you got another story, at the end of one of the sessions, of course, being a pro-life legislator, uh, I think Tim Schallenberger was speaker. This is not at the first. This is in my, probably my second term. But Tim Schallenberger is speaker and Dick Bond is president on the Senate side, both pretty good politically to get the session closed down. As you know, closing a session down is not always the easiest, easiest thing. And so I'm new, new enough that I didn't, still was trying to catch on to stuff in a lot of areas, never been on a conference committee yet. And so Dick comes up to me and he says, Nick, you're going to chair a conference committee. And I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah. And I said, okay, well, tell me about this. <laughs> when do I call a meeting? Where do I call a meeting? What do I do? And he says, well, you got to call a meeting out at the rail, uh, but don't worry about the conference committee reports already written. Well, I'm naive enough to think, oh, well, that was nice of you. <laughs> you know, all you got to do is go out and get a vote on it. And, oh, well, golly, you made this awful easy, Dick. I really appreciate you doing this for a new legislator, you know, a new guy. So we did a little, I come in and I'm preparing to debate this conference committee, which was a pro-life issue. It was roundly defeated. Uh, for all the reasons we know now, f why is they had the votes already set up. They, the conference committee was just something that Schallenberger and the House must have asked for to, the Senate to at least look at before the closing of the session. And so, so I learned a little bit about uh, some of the workings uh, through that, that process. And uh, those are all things you kind of learn one from, you know. Finally, I did learn what conference committees were, obviously, through all the other committees I chaired and worked on, but that was my newest, sure. newest endeavor. 
Um, I would also note that uh, during that 96 session, you, of course, spent time as a colleague in the Senate here with Jerry Moran before yes. he first ran for Congress yes. during the 96 election. Can you tell us about your initial impressions of him and whether you had any inkling as to whether he had such a bright political future? Also, I'm guessing you likely still enjoy a friendly and ongoing relationship with him? I do. I really haven't talked to him for a while, but I, I knew Jerry before he was in politics. Uh, I was vice chair of the State Tourism Commission, and Jerry was chairman mm -hmm. of the Tourism Commission, and he was a lawyer in Hayes. And so we had several meetings together, and I knew Jerry before he even ran for office. He was just a, a good lawyer out in, in Hutchinson at that time. Or, yeah, Hutchinson at that time. Uh, so I, I, I've known him. Uh, we've always gotten along good, liked him. Uh, initial, I don't, I don't know that I have a big initial impression or whether he was going to go a long ways in politics. Uh, you could see he, you know, he treated people fairly as far as I was concerned and, and ran ran the chamber pretty good mm -hmm. um, and we we have stayed in contact since like I said I haven't talked to him for a while but we've stayed in contact one way or another in fact one of the people who worked on my congressional campaign now works with him okay uh, so I've still got contacts, contacts with there. the office and stuff um, less than a year before you entered the Senate chamber uh, we already talked a little about uh, Bill Graves moderate Republican mm -hmm. who had been Secretary of State he, he gets elected governor in 1994 mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you've already talked a little about this, but you always uh, seem to me to have a good working relationship with Governor Graves uh, during his time in office. So from 96 through 2002, he, he was governor and, and you were here in the Senate. Any other stories about your relationship with him or others on uh, second floor during, during that time? I don't know if there's another story. Uh, we did get along, obviously probably didn't agree on some of the issues and things. Uh, I can always remember him and Joe, and I can't remember Joe's last name, that was his kind of right-hand guy, uh, used to always come up and say, Nick, we understand your district, we understand your base, fine. Uh, you know, we understand why you vote the way you vote and all this didn't hold anything. So we had a relationship where we could talk and, mm -hmm. and uh, understand each other. Okay, um, more generally, uh, the mid to late 90s was a time defined uh, by some strong internal disagreements within uh, the increasingly dominant Republican legislative majority, and you've talked a little about this, with, with Graves himself frequently siding with the more moderate mm -hmm. faction. Um, this was a period where both the state and national economies were quite strong, and one of the flashpoints involved tax policy, uh, with major reductions being a top priority of many conservatives. Uh, during these years, Kansas enacted a major tax cut in the statewide mill levy for schools uh, in 97 and also a broad smorgasbord of tax cuts in 1998. Uh, Graves and other moderates during this time, especially here in the Senate, were wanting to move a little slower on many of these tax cuts than some of the more conservative House members across the rotunda. Um, Senate President Dick Bond, your fellow Johnson Countyan, was, was a moderate who normally flew in formation with, with Graves on these matters. Do you have any more stories or recollections about some of these uh, tax cut battles of the mid to late 90s and where, where you may have fit in? I, I probably fit in uh, on a different side than Bill Graves and Dick Bond did on most of them. Um, but again, you know, I've always, had a, I've always had a philosophy, and we may mention this all the way through, I think it's important, the proverb that says, bind kindness and truth around your neck and you'll find favor with God and man. Um, I've always thought kindness is an important part of being a person, whether it's in the political realm. Anger doesn't really achieve goals very often. <laughs> uh, kindness can, and you can disagree with people. Again, I believe on the truth side, it, um, you simply, truth is not an easy thing to get to. <laughs> And I don't know that you ever know for sure, but at least you get to a position that's intelligent, that you believe in, you think is right, mm -hmm. and you stand for that. Now, you don't have to get angry at somebody that disagrees with where you're at. You know, I've done my homework. I'm where I am. I am who I am, and I'm going to vote how I am. And so we probably disagreed on some of those uh, issues, uh, probably a list of those issues, uh, but we always seem to be okay on the relationship. We always seem to be able to continue the relationship and not uh, close the door. And, and as everybody knows, when you're in the legislature, in the Senate, or you're serving, um, 
a lot of the time, most of the stuff you're dealing with is pretty run of the mill, mm -hmm. uh, easy issues that, and there's gonna be days where it isn't an easy issue and you're gonna agree with somebody who you were in a war with, war with a month ago, you know, now you got, and so it's not good to build walls. It's not good to, you know, build a wall between you and someone else uh, to the extent that you, that you become ineffective. Yeah. And so I, 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 that's a long answer to your question, but I just think we probably disagreed on some of the stuff, um, but I was hoping we could still work together on things we would agree on. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the relationship building is an important uh, subplot to your whole, whole career up it here. Um, okay, moving along uh, our timeline, is there anything worth recalling about your 2000 reelection campaign? History shows that you again had little trouble against your Democratic opponent, Cheryl Maddox, and, and got 59% of the vote. Any memories about the uh, 2000 election year? No, I'll say this, and on my next election, what I always tried to do, Chris, was I always tried to call the person that was gonna oppose me and say, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and let's talk. And uh, generally that happened. I don't remember that. I know the next one we talk about, we did, mm -hmm. uh, because we'd had a relationship being from the same town and having served sort of together. Um, I always thought that was important to do that, and that always kind of dispelled some of the real crazy stuff that can happen yeah. in a campaign. It kind of put it to rest. Uh, so I can't, I can't remember anything overly about that, except again, it was a typical campaign, been very active in the community, uh, been out doing things, and I would suppose that's why we got the vote we got. But, by the way, I think that's to your credit, having a cup of coffee with your opponent. I think yeah. that... <laughs> We that, tried. Some nice of them refuse. Some of them okay. refuse, but you, at least it's nice to try. Okay. Um, can you tell us what you remember about the stresses of the 2002 and 2003 legislative sessions? You may recall that the 9-11 terrorist attacks and subsequent recession had a crippling impact on the state's economy and on tax collections. Certainly the solid days of the late 90s, just a few years earlier, must have seemed a distant mm -hmm. memory. Uh, if I recall, lawmakers in 2002 had to enact both painful budget cuts as well as a tax increase just to keep the state out of red ink for fiscal 2003. It, it was a tough time. It was a real tough time uh, making the budget work. And as you know, there's items like education that there are at least close to 50% of the state general fund budget goes to education. And so when you're facing a situation like that, it gets, it gets tough to try to figure out how to handle your obligations that you have. And of course, CAPERS, our retirement program, it was always had an unfunded liability and you're trying to figure out how do we, how do we get all this back on track and yet we don't really have the money to do it <laughs> and we're really fighting a, a, a terrible economy and trying to make it happen. Um, and so it was, it was extremely tough. Uh, to get through that time and try to figure out how to make it work. And I, I don't know if it was that time frame, I remember Governor Parkinson had to increase the sales tax to try to help bring us through. That too. would have been the next recession. Yeah, yeah. next recession. So, yeah. Um, okay, well, now that we are into the 2000s, I want to get into uh, the key issues um, and your day is chairing the Economic Development and uh, Commerce Committees. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that you might characterize the Kansas Economic Growth Act of 2004 as one of your greatest legislative achievements. Uh, you and your colleague across the rotunda in the House, Representative Kenny Wilk, of course, were the two famous godfathers of that very important uh, legislation. And this is your chance, I think, to crow a little more about the importance of it and all of its economic development uh, offshoot initiatives. Um, your version of um, having Kansas become a, a, a major player, I'm sorry, your vision of having Kansas become a major player in the biosciences industry was fulfilled, at least for a number of years. The state successfully acquired NBAF, of course. Uh, the Animal Health Corridor was developed, and there were uh, a number of successes we, we can point to. So feel free to take a victory lap or two at this juncture, but please tell us about your vision and mindset uh, and any and all political challenges that you and, and Kenny and, and Governor Sebelius uh, faced in getting that legislation across the finish line in 2004. Sure, uh, we actually, Kenny and I had talked about several things. We thought about energy policy, we thought about other uh, big initiatives, and it was, it was at that time at least my opinion that the legislature 
uh, reacted to a bigger vision easier than to just little nitpicky things uh, trying to do things. So we sit down and it took a long time to develop this Kansas Economic Growth Act. It took a long time uh, to develop it. But we saw the biosciences as a great opportunity and nationally it was blooming. A lot of states were beginning to look at bioscience and what they could do in the bioscience area. Uh, and so we sat down, how do you do that? What do, what do we do? And uh, obviously that act had several elements to it. It had, uh, you know, it, we were trying to attract eminent scholars and rising star researchers, which we did some. We, we uh, attracted a gentleman, that we did some, but we attracted a gentleman who was uh, really into the composite materials. And he ended up, I think, at Wichita State as a researcher, brought his team. When you, when you attract one of these, they bring a team with them. Uh, and uh, he went to Wichita, and actually the composite became a big deal in aircraft manufacturing, but he started saying, hey, this would really work with replacing knees and hips and shoulders. And so he kind of became a forerunner, so to speak, in using composite materials possibly in, in joint replacements. Uh, and so that kind of thing was happening. And of course we saw the KU Cancer Center had was just kind of coming up and coming on its own. and. Uh, we would talk to researchers at the universities, and the thing that really amazed me about the researchers at the universities were they're great about discoveries. They love to discover. They love to find something, but they had no, it just kind of stopped there. And so we wanted to try to figure out how do you get a discovery from the researcher's hands and into a local business, some kind of company growing uh, in the Kansas area. How do we take this and make it more than just a great research center, but also a good startup, good good business side to this thing, economic development part of it. And so we developed programs on working on doing that and getting that done as a part of the Economic Growth Act. And I'll, I'll tell you, I remember I was asked to go over to Washington University in uh, St. Louis, mm -hmm. to a, which is a great research university. I was asked to come over and speak to a conference right after this passed. And there was a gentleman from Massachusetts there because Massachusetts was touting this great bioscience initiative that they had passed. And he, fortunately, he went first. And, uh, and this room was full of probably top flight researchers, way over my head type people. Corporate CEOs in the bioscience industry were sitting in the room. Everybody was there. And he, he was going through what Massachusetts did. And they'd start asking him questions. He says, well, yeah, we're doing that, but the legislature hasn't quite signed off on it yet. And that happened several times through. And so I got up and spoke, and our dollar-wise, our initiative was as big or bigger than Massachusetts. And it just blew the crowd away, because we'd done it. It was done. It was happening. It was going on, you know? And he, um, he came up to me after, he says, Nick, can I get a copy of your bioscience initiative <laughs> and maybe talk to you a little bit more about it? And uh, so that's the kind of, that's how big this was. That's yeah. how important this was. This is what it meant even nationally uh, to a lot of people. Uh, it, was a, it was a big deal. It was, and, and one thing we tried to do, Chris, too, was uh, we tried to form a group that wasn't a, a state agency. Mm -hmm. You know, we formed a board uh, that had state legislators on it, had representatives from state government on it, but it was really business people who understood how to grow a, bioscience company and how to make this thing work. Uh, and we did that to kind of keep it an arm's length away. We, we set up a funding mechanism for it uh, to kind of keep it out of the state government thing. All of that said, now, your next comment may be what happened, <laughs> you know. We'll get there, yes. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll address that in a moment. But it was well known. The other half of that, which, by the way, when we were doing the bioscience initiative, we knew that pro-life was going to enter into it and wherever the money was going to be spent. And we did put a segment in the bioscience initiative that none of the money could be used for embryonic stem cell research. Mm -hmm. But we wanted the money used to set up an adult stem cell research facility at KU, and they did. Okay. And, uh, so they have an adult stem cell research uh, opportunity at KU. The other side of the Economic Growth Act, which was important, uh, was at the time, as we were talking, coming through these recessions, uh, rural Kansas was really suffering. Uh, ag and oil business was really, really having a tough time struggling. So the other side of that Kansas Economic Growth Act was what we called this Kansas Center for Entrepreneurship. And that was designed to go in and help businesses and uh, people in rural Kansas. 
uh, to be successful. You know, how can we support them? How can we be successful? And we gave a tax credit. If you donate to them to operate it, they got a tax credit for their donation and things. That has, that's, it's now known as Network Kansas. And that, they are doing a phenomenal job. If you go into almost any rural Kansas community now and say, hey, Network Kansas, they'll go, oh man, those are our heroes. Uh, they're tied in really well with the SBA now. Uh, I know the Kaufman Foundation's given them grants. Um, so they're getting funding outside now that's just, they are really respected and looked up to. I think uh, the gentleman Steve Radley runs it. And I think Steve was uh, even served on a committee for the Federal Reserve of Kansas City. Uh, they've, just, they've just grown into yeah. a heck of an operation, a really great operation. So between the two, and to be honest with you, if you remember the Kansas Economic Growth Act passed both the House and the Senate by wide margins. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a close vote whatsoever. It was a wide margin. And I think so all those elements helped bring the votes in and get it done. And, and it, was a great, it was a great act. I mean, it was a great process. Absolutely. Okay, uh, as long as we are in 2004, let's again talk electoral politics. Uh, the record book shows that you, yet again, that November had few problems with your Democratic challenger, a gentleman named Pete Roman. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm guessing the more interesting part of that election year story for you involves the August GOP primary. Uh, Representative Lisa Benlin opted to try and move across the rotunda and challenge you for the Republican nomination in a primary that drew significant statewide attention and, and interest. Uh, although you prevailed fairly easily with 58% of the primary vote, I, I want to know how that type of stress must have been uh, different than, than general election stress. Uh, uh, also, the perception uh, was that Lisa may have been more moderate than you were on a number of topics, including K-12 funding, as well as certain social issues. Uh, so some of the factional divisions uh, that have been growing within the party that we've been talking about over the previous decade were now suddenly front and, and center for you. What, what are your recollections about this time on, on the campaign trail? I was actually sorry that Lisa ran because we'd had a decent relationship. Uh, she is one that I did go have a cup of coffee with and said, Lisa, uh, what are we doing? And uh, she just felt like, and of course, I think education funding was a core, a core issue that, that she wanted to address. Um, and we had our coffee and it was very congenial. And um, I, I actually didn't know if she was gonna run after we had our coffee, but she did. Uh, and that was fine. Um, I don't know that I treated it any differently than I had others. Again, I'd been involved in the community. We did. We ran an aggressive campaign, door to door. We did. We had a lot of volunteers. We just did our work, our due diligence, in the campaign. And as you said, it turned out to be a good result uh, for us. Um, I I don't know if this is a spot to talk a little bit about K through 12 education because I was always uh, I was always kind of uh, everybody kind of go, well, Nick, you're from Johnson County. What the heck? Um, I always felt like, and I had a very, very good friend who was the superintendent of one of the big school districts in Johnson County. Uh, really in those days, it may have changed a little now, but in those days, when we passed these huge education bills, very little of that money was ever seen in Johnson County and Johnson County schools because most of it was the free lunch and the you know, special needs kids and things. And Johnson County at that time didn't have that many. And so I always voted for more local control. I was always a yes vote for that because I felt like maybe that's the only solution for Johnson County Schools is to get a little more local control to get the funding they need uh, to run the schools. But that never really progressed in the legislature. Uh, and so, you know, I, Lisa or whoever, lots of times would run against me. I had a lady named Sue Gamble who'd been on the Shiner Mission School Board at one point. Uh, run and, and it was all education related and I, I just simply would say in all the forums what I just said. Uh, it's great but the formula is not really working well for Johnson County Schools and so I'm just trying to find a way for us to get you know the funding that the school districts seem to think they need. Uh, again responsibly they gotta they gotta account for it, but but it, it just isn't a good formula for our schools. And so that's the reason I always kind of was in the position I was in. And um, sometimes that won, sometimes it wasn't really liked. <laughs> so. yeah. Okay, uh, during your final six sessions uh, here in the Senate for the 2003 through 2008 sessions, 
Governor Graves was no longer around and you now had Democratic Governor Kathleen Sebelius calling the shots from second floor here at the State House. She had been insurance commissioner for a number of years uh, when you first arrived before being elected uh, governor in 2002. Did your paths ever cross much during those early years before she became governor? And once she was, uh, how were the policy dynamics different for you and other members of the GOP Senate caucus here in dealing with her versus what they had been un under Graves? I really didn't have a whole lot of contact with her when she was governor, to be honest with you. We obviously had some contact when we did the Kansas Economic Growth Act. Uh, but not a, an abundance amount of contact and certainly didn't before. In fact, I had some people trying to get me to run for insurance commissioner. Oh, really? <laughs> she was. And I obviously didn't and didn't think that'd be something I wanted. But um, I didn't really have a lot of contact with her. We, you know, we, I, uh, I don't know, I can't say anything other than that. I just didn't have a lot of contact with her. Did with some of her staff on issues and committee work and stuff. but not really a whole lot of contact with her. Okay, um, Governor Sebelius, as, as you may recall, in 2006, uh, jumped in and embraced a proposed property tax exemption for business machinery and equipment, mm -hmm. an idea that had been batted around previously by some Republican legislators. Uh, that bill was in fact enacted uh, with people in both parties touting uh, potential economic development growth as, as a key reason. So I assume it's safe to say that you were part of the broad bipartisan coalition that championed the so-called M and E exemption in 2006. Uh, but of course the property tax base is like a balloon in that when you squeeze one side of it um, to, to reduce that particular part, the other side gets bigger. Yeah. In, in other words, um, the concern was about the extent to which removing a major class of property from the tax rolls was going to shift the burden onto the remaining classes, especially residential. Uh, so the 2006 exemption legislation contained an intricate formula that set up so-called slider payments that were going to reimburse local units uh, for five years for at least a portion of the lost receipts in an effort to minimize some of the mill levy increases and tax shifts that were otherwise going to occur. Uh, the payments were scheduled to decrease over five years and slide away before sunsetting altogether, hence they became known as the slider payments. Uh, but, but this was based on the theory that economic growth brought about as a result of the exemption would have boosted everyone's tax base uh, back to at least uh, sort of a hold harmless mm -hmm. position. Um, unfortunately for local units of government planning on these funds, what ended up happening is that by the time the slider formula got implemented in 2008, there was really only one set of payments that went out because of the onset of the Great Recession. Um, policymakers grappling with the fallout for the state budget soon repealed the remaining four years of those payments to help shore up the state's financial coffers. Um, so feel free to talk about what you recall about the exemption and slider payments, but, but also more importantly, what th this episode may have re uh, revealed about the intersection of tax cuts and the potential to stimulate economic growth. Given your expertise in both economic development and tax policy, uh, what do you think about the inclusion of mandatory benchmarks in exchange for tax concessions? And even depending on the circumstances, sometimes some form of clawbacks. Mm -hmm. Should policymakers as a rule seek to tighten uh, tax breaks down to ensure that they are maximizing their bang for the buck? The cost benefit analysis questions and controversies have only seemed to grow more intense in recent years. And I know your perspective on them could be especially illuminating. I don't know. Uh, obviously, it was, the M&E was basically an economic growth policy that w we, we thought would have the results you're talking about, that eventually the tax, it would grow the tax base and uh, in the end be, be successful in doing so, which is, you know, kind of every incentive program you pass, you're hoping that's kind of the result, is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to eventually have a real growth aspect to it for the community. And I, again, Wyandotte County and the Star Bonds, is, to me, is the kind of the ultimate example of how you do an incentive package and it ends up transforming a county in the state of Kansas economically. Uh, so I think, I think it's all about economic growth. I, I've talked to many people and still do because there's kind of this growing anti-economic development incentive 
uh, growth, and I, and I understand it. I really do understand some of it because I think some of the economic development and incentive programs are being abused and have been abused in a lot of different ways. I, I tried, even when I was in the cabinet and after, to talk to people about star bonds in particular and say that I, I offered some ways I thought that should be tightened up and uh, changed a little bit uh, because it, it's turned into something totally different than what we originally wrote the bill to do. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're getting these nice regional tourism. Now it's down to if you have a little amphitheater for local concerts, that's now a tourism attraction, you know, and, and they've added other things to it. So I understand, and I, I tell most local people, people I talk to, it, it's really important that you do the cost-benefit analysis. It, there should be some kind of a return on investment to the community uh, for doing it. Uh, and most people forget that in the case if you give sales tax, you're probably going to pick up new property tax. You've got other tax, pro tax revenue sources that are probably going to benefit the community, even though you're giving up a piece of it for future growth. Um, there's other ways to bring it in. But do your cost-benefit analysis. Do your return on investment analysis. Make sure that any deal you do is accountable, that there are benchmarks, that there are clawbacks. Um, I know of one community that did a a nice, what should have been a great economic development process. It looked great on paper. All the renderings were wonderful. It was outstanding and awesome. Uh, unfortunately, the, the developer didn't really have the finances to pull it off, <laughs> you know. Plus, nobody told them that they only had five years to get it done or wow. whatever benchmark you wanted to put in it. They didn't do that. So it just drug along, drug along, and drug along, and the city was captured in this agreement that really was not a good agreement. So, you know, do your cost-benefit analysis, put in accountability measures uh, on where they should be, um, and then transparency, you know, talk about the benefits, talk about why, talk about what the development is uh, so that people understand what you're trying to do. I, I, I know one city who had a, uh, actually a blighted building set in the middle of a residential area that used to be a school. Um, and of course the neighbors didn't want it. Some guy came in to develop condos and the neighbor didn't want it because he was gonna go a couple of stories higher than the school was in their neighborhood. And so you go, well, and I understand again. Okay, I understand you don't want a multi, but what's that school building gonna look like two years, five years, 10 years from now if something doesn't happen with that school building? And probably it, it's not financially feasible to go and tear down and build a couple of homes. Yeah. So what are you gonna do with it? So I. I just, you just really got to put some thought into the incentives and economic development programs to make them, to make them proper and to make sure there isn't an abuse uh, of some kind uh, in that development. So in today's world, um, I don't know that you can ever do developments anymore without some kind of an incentive package. The developers are so now used to, no matter where they walk into, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be an incentive package. And if you don't offer one, uh, they're going to say, well, thank you, and they walk away from your city, your county, your state, whatever it may be. But again, I, I just can't stress enough, ride them tight. <laughs> you know, yeah. Ride them so that they, they, they have the least amount of opportunity to be abused, and then evaluate. Don't be afraid to say no. Mm -hmm. if it's, I, I did a deal when I was over here in Secretary of Commerce, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit ago, a little bit. Um, we had a big deal, billion-dollar deal. A thousand jobs coming in to negotiate with us. Of course, everybody's now got consultants they bring in to negotiate with you on, and <laughs> you know, God bless them. They're they're going to be as aggressive as they can be for mm -hmm. their client. Uh, and so we gave we gave them what we could. And one day they came in just to keep hammering for incentives. And I think I shocked the staff over at Commerce. I actually went, can't do anymore. We're done. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the staff thought, oh, Nick, you're going to lose this. <laughs> well, guess what? They did the, they did the billion dollar project and added the jobs. Um, so, I, you know, you just got to be intelligent in how you handle them. But they're a necessary evil. I guess you'd say they're a necessary evil today uh, for development to happen Understood. Uh, in any community or state. Um, you've also told me in the past about the Kansas Academy of Mathematics yes. and Sciences program that you helped get approved sometime back in, in this era. Uh, correct me if I got the name wrong, and please give us the details you remember. Sure. Um, I had two constituents come to me. One was, one was a professor at Johnson County Community College, and the other was a, a uh, retired superintendent of schools. And they said, hey, we got an idea because um, it, 
it's kind of tied to the bioscience deal. They said, you know, we've got some really bright high school students that are exceptional. Uh, and they're really bored because they're so high level in math and science that high school, they're, they're losing interest because they're becoming bored. And they said, we got an idea. Why don't we form the Kansas Mathematics Academy for Mathematics and Science? And uh, when, what that was, was when a student was a junior in high school, uh, they could apply for the academy. It was limited to 40 students in any given semester. Um, apply to the academy, if accepted, they left their junior year of high school uh, and went to college. And they could um, have an accelerated science and math education. Uh, it's at Fort Hayes State, uh, accelerated math and science education. We've, it's been very successful, still going. Uh, I admit some of the kids who actually um, have patents, own patents of companies and ideas they had. One kid had a deal where you could take your car key chain and point at your car and it'd tell you everything that's wrong with your car. So when you went to the mechanic, you weren't at the, mm -hmm. you know, you weren't at the uh, mechanic's mercy. Yeah. Mercy, yeah. So anyway, it was, it's great. It's still going. I know when the kids come up now, almost every legislator and everybody wants pictures with them. It was, they were a little reluctant at first to send junior high age kids to, to a university setting, which is why we wanted it on something like Fort Hayes, where it wasn't a huge campus and that. They're housed in a dorm where the uh, campus police are headquartered right below them. Uh, there's a lot of safety features to it. They can't participate in sports uh, because of the NCAA rules, uh, but they can in every other out. And we went out with Black and Beach executives once, and Raba Moran went with us, and she went. At, we talked to them, and and by the way, that class was mainly girls, which was really good. Um, she, we were talking to them. They were telling us about all these projects they got going, which they got to do in their classes and how great they are, highly motivated. Spring break, they were just as happy about getting their projects done as they were going on a cruise or to a beach. Uh, they were just phenomenal kids, yet they were just normal kids. Uh, and Robert goes, okay, now, just so I don't think you're all geeks, are you doing anything on campus on the creative side of your mind? Every one of them raised their hands. They were in drama, they were in something, right. uh, some kind of activity, creative uh, side too. So it's a great program. It ended up a lot of MIT and some of the bigger universities started coming in trying to recruit these kids to get them out of Kansas. And we probably lost some uh, through that process, but it's been a great program. Very impressive. Okay, uh, before we get into 2008 uh, and your decision to leave the legislature to run for Congress, we, sh we should point out that your lengthy legislative career also overlapped with future governors Mark Parkinson, Jeff Collier, and Laura Kelly. Since we've talked a little, um, a little about uh, other famous names, I, I suppose we should ask about your relationships and memories regarding future governors Parkinson, Collier, and Kelly. Do you have any amusing stories or recollections about them and how effective they seem to be when they were legislators? I, uh, actually, Laura, my only memory would be as a legislator. I haven't really dealt with her as governor. Uh, the, Mark Parkinson I'd known, uh, kind of an interesting sidelight on Mark is we served with him in the Senate. Uh, he obviously was a champion of getting unified government formed in Wyandotte County. Uh, worked with him okay on things. Uh, the interesting thing between Mark and I was he always had an interest in the hotel business. He had some rel relative who was with the Hyatt Corporation. And so we had a lot of conversations about the hotel business, to be honest with you, and it was interesting. Uh, Jeff Collier, I had known uh, before being up here. Uh, I supported Jeff in his congressional run back in Johnson County uh, and knew him then. I really didn't serve very long because I kind of left about the same time Sam left uh, to become an ambassador at large. So I really didn't get to serve with him as governor uh, long at all. So. Huh. Um, well, please tell us about your 2008 uh, election year and your decision to challenge incumbent uh, Democratic Congressman Dennis Moore in, in the 3rd District. I'm guessing that how well you had performed at the ballot box across a decent swath of Johnston County in the 96, 2000, and 2004 state Senate elections must have made you an attractive option to be the GOP candidate that time around. 
Were you approached by state and national party officials and encouraged to run, or was it a decision you came to more on your own? Basically, that it was time to try and move on and take your policymaking skills to another level of government. I, yeah, I, there was just a multitude. I'm trying to think of all the reasons why I did what I did. Uh, to a lot of people, it was the right, wasn't the right timing. Uh, Dennis had been 16 year incumbent in Congress, uh, was a popular district attorney before going to Congress. Uh, and to some people, it wasn't the right timing. Uh, in some ways, it was the right timing because I had no primary challenge whatsoever. I was the, the Republican candidate for the seat. Um, I was really recruited by a number of different ways and means. A lot of local people uh, wanted me to do it, had been bugging me for two or three years to do it, uh, had been on me about it. Uh, and then Washington, D.C., I had a lot of contact from D.C. at the time. Uh, the RNC sent me what they thought was one of their top campaign managers. Uh, so there was kind of a mixture uh, of a lot of different encouragement to run. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be, any, you know, we weren't going to walk into Congress by any means. You know, it was going to be a real tough race. Uh, and it was quite an, it was, it was an extraordinary experience because even D.C., um, I, I addressed the Republican Congo conference up at the, at the Capitol two, three, four times. A lot of the congressmen got really, we had a lot of congressmen come in. John Boehner came in for me four or five times. Um, of course, George W. Bush came in, the president came in for me. Dick Cheney came in for At me. At fundraisers and? Fundraisers, mainly. Um, and we raised a, a, what I thought was a real good amount of money, although I hated every moment of fundraising. Uh, we raised a million and a half, two million dollars for that race. Uh, which was good coming against a 16-year incumbent. We, mm -hmm. So, again, the community was receptive. A lot of people in the business community were very receptive uh, to me running. At the, at the end of the day, again, we didn't make it. Even with all that, I I went back and addressed the major Republican donors nationally. They had uh, these people into the Mayflower Hotel. I can remember that one, and they brought me in to address their major donors to the Republican Party uh, to get them in, and we got some donations from you know, people across the country. Uh, so it was, it was quite, an, quite a deal. It was two years of my life uh, with no income <laughs> and just yeah. running your tail off to try to make a, a race work. Um, debates with Dennis, we did real well in the debates, very well in the debates. Um, so it was, it was a great experience. I wouldn't turn it in for anything. And of course, my grandkids got to meet a president, a vice president, and everybody else during the session, and they've got a lot of memories too. But um, anyway, I, I was recruited pretty heavily by local and national people and uh, thought, let's take a shot. Okay. Um, I would note that for a time in 2009, 2010, uh, you were again considered as maybe the front runner for the third district uh, congressional GOP nomination, this time against Mr. Moore's spouse, who was seeking to retain that seat for, for the Democrats. From, from what you told the press in April of 2010, when you decided to opt out of the GOP primary, which effectively cleared the way for future Congressman Kevin Yoder to defeat Ms. Moore that November, it looks like you sort of decided to, to take one for the team and stay out of the primary race so as to give whomever, whomever was going to be the GOP nominee a better chance in the general election. Is that pretty much the full story about your decision to pull out or were there other factors involved in your thinking at all? That's really, that's really the story. There were six or seven Republicans jumped in that primary that year. Uh, I'd just gone through two years of spending eight hours a day trying to find funds for a campaign. Uh, and run for a campaign and was kind of worn out. And when six or seven people got in, you're all fighting for the dollar. Um, I, and for the Republican Party, why, do, why, why, just goodbye guys. The interesting thing was after I dropped out, I can, I remember this, I was driving, I was taking, we were taking our grandkids to lunch and I had my grandson in my car with me when the media started calling me, asking me, what, what are you doing? Why are you dropping out? And uh, my grandson, looked over at me and he was real young at that point. He looked at me and he says, Grandpa, I'm glad you're not leaving. And I thought, okay, that, that ends it. <laughs> right decision, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, we have been badgering you with one significant omission about your relationships with many prominent Kansas politicians over the last 30 years. 
So now we do want to get into you and Sam Brownback. Mm -hmm. uh, when you arrived in Topeka, he was already in, in Congress. But I, I'm guessing your paths must have crossed prior to 2010 when he came back to run for governor, especially since you would go on to become such a key figure, figure in his cabinet. Please tell us about when you first met him, any interactions you had with him and his staff when he was serving in Congress, and whether you may have been involved in some capacity with his initial 2010 gubernatorial campaign. Um, I'd known Sam before when he was in Congress, when he was in the House and then moved to the Senate, um, just because, again, the Convention Bureau job I had at that time was just a high visible uh, I was in the media back in Johnson County all the time. It was just a high deal. So uh, it brought me in contact with a lot of people. So I knew Sam back uh, before, you know, when he was in Congress uh, and moved to the Senate. And we went to D.C. a few times and went over and saw him at his office and spent time with him. So, yeah, there was a little bit of a relationship. I actually served on his transition team uh, in, in 2010 before becoming governor, mainly to help with economic development type okay. issues. We came up with real opportunity zones at that time uh, and some of the other policy he brought out uh, on the economic development side. So yeah, we had a relationship. Okay. Uh, when he is elected in 2010, you are quickly named as the new Kansas Secretary of Revenue, replacing your longtime predecessor, Joan Wagnon, who had been there during the Sebelius and Parkinson years. Uh, history will, will recall that by 2012, Governor Brownback was rather famously pushing for some dramatic changes to the state's tax code, with many of his proposals getting enacted. You, of course, as Secretary of Revenue, were a major point person for his tax policy initiatives. During 2012, there was some parliamentary maneuvering on the Senate floor where we're now sitting, and I think, to be fair, we should point out that the final version that landed on his desk was not exactly the version he preferred. Uh, he nevertheless did sign it into law, and the great self-described tax experiment was off and running. What are some of your memories from 2012? Uh, Arthur Laffer, the famous economist, was flown into the state as a special consultant. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, he didn't consult as much on the tax policy. He supported the, the philosophy or principle behind it. Uh, that, you know, states with low state income taxes were doing much better economically. Of course, Florida and Texas at that time were kind of the, you know, the goalposts that everybody was shooting for. Uh, South Dakota had been moving towards a zero, and I, they may have been to zero at that time. Um, and I mentioned South Dakota because lots of times people would say, well, if we're not Florida and Texas, we don't have the tourism and everything. And I always used to say, well, South Dakota... Uh, is not a real tourism hotspot either in a lot of ways, and so we could compare a little bit about South Dakota and Kansas and where we were trying to head. Okay. Um, I think it reasonable to say that because the fiscal impact of the 2012 legislation turned out to be more costly than some of that law's proponents had hoped, the legislature seemed to have spending cuts, so-called smoke and mirrors budget gimmicks, and even backfilling tax increases on the table pretty much annually for each of the next five years. On this latter approach of backfilling tax hikes, in 2013, you and other administration officials had to help get that legislation across the finish line. Democrats, of course, were not eager to help bail the governor out at that point, uh, so that tax increase had to be enacted with only GOP votes. That 2013 bill had a sales tax increase and reductions in both itemized and standard deductions from the income tax as its most controversial features. What was getting anti-tax Republicans, especially many nervous freshmen who had come in with the 2012 election, to vote for that plan a huge challenge for you and the governor and GOP legislative leadership? Obviously was. Uh, the whole tax policy was a huge challenge from day one. And I think, I think some things, Chris, to remember. One is when Sam Brownback became governor, uh, Kansas was experiencing a, a horrible uh, rebound from a recession. Uh, it, it, nationally, it was lasting longer. I mean, Federal Reserve was saying it was probably the longest, longest lasting recession comebacks uh, that they had ever seen. Uh, the state was running a deficit. Uh, we had about 7% unemployment in the state. Um, 
And so I want to say that because that, I think, enters into a lot of what finally ended up because we just were struggling. I, we still, the oil industry was really struggling, the ag industry. We had a huge depopulation of rural communities. Uh, they were losing people. Uh, and so I think part of the motivation of trying to do a tax policy was looking at some of these other states and the success we're having. Yet how do you do that? You can't go to zero tomorrow. You gotta, if you're gonna do it, you've gotta have this sliding scale, which this, the governor wanted to do. And if you remember right, we had a formula that was actually in a bill before any of the tax reductions was ever proposed, and it was if state general fund receipts uh, were below 102% of the receipts from the year before, nothing was gonna happen. And same with the 7.5 ending balance. Nothing was gonna happen if we weren't there. That was, I think it was Senate Bill 339. That was one of the first things we tried to get passed and passed. And then subsequently came the bill that started knocking the, the income tax down to three and 4.9% from the three brackets to two brackets, three and 4.9. And of course, we'll talk about small business in a moment because I'll, I'll say I'm a guilty party and, and a big believer in that part of that tax policy, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, but that was put in. And then we had the payoffs or the, you know, the, one, the elements of reducing some tax credits to try to help pay for the tax policy, uh, believing that once you lower taxes, tax credits don't near mean as much <laughs> as they would have before you reduced it. So we thought, okay, as we're reducing these and we reduced we did, took away a lot of business tax credits because if we're going to zero, okay, you know, you, just all of that was trying to be mixed in. Well, as you know, all the pay-fors were kind of removed uh, from the bill. I think the initial fiscal note on the original bill was $110 million, as it was written by the governor. Uh, and then we started this whole iteration of tax policy bills over the next two years. I think we had, what, three reiterations. I mean, we just had, just kept going at it. Um, and some of them put back in the payoffs, some of them took them out. Uh, and then I think one of the final bills went ahead where the governor had put this formula in not to, not to try to progress to zero unless it made sense with the state general fund. Uh, all of a sudden we had this five or six year tax reduction schedule <laughs> and uh, we're still spending quite a bit of money in the state budget. Uh, and it was just, it was a horrible, uh, coming together uh, of a lot of things that made the policy very, very difficult yeah. to work. Uh, I, if I can talk for a moment about small, small business, um, small business is the backbone of the economy. I, no matter where you're at, it's the backbone of an economy, nationally or statewide. And we were thinking, well, who could benefit the most maybe in job creation? Um, who, could, who could really benefit the most if we could get someone to zero? Uh, and so we picked small business and put them in there uh, to get them to zero. We should have, and we did propose that that be capped at $100,000. It wasn't, for whatever reason, it wasn't. Uh, and we talked about that two or three times and it just didn't happen. I think that would have made a world of difference in the bill. This would have been the, the concept, as, as, as you noted, the bill contained an exemption for uh, all non-wage business income. Right. Uh, but some of the early iterations would have uh, only exempted the first 100,000 of non-wage business income. That's, that's what well, we're Well, I talking don't know about. if that was ever in. That was something we decided after the bill had passed, actually. We said, boy, we ought to, we ought to cap this at 100,000. You would, you would include most small businesses in Kansas, a high percentage, probably 90% or so of the small business would be included in that. Under but you would also eliminate what became the real criticism of that bill was, well, the Koch brothers and all these other big corporations are taking advantage of this, this tax policy. That would have eliminated that. That, that would have been harder to argue that. Uh, we actually had, according to the tax division, um, we had an enormous amount of new small business tax returns come in, and they were new. And the reason I mention this is, the tax division would tell me the person's name, their FIN, their numbers, their federal numbers, nothing had ever been on a, on a Kansas uh, income tax return in the past. So we had a tremendous influx of small business at the time, which I would assume a lot of the Missouri uh, small businesses may have came over to start taking advantage of the tax policy. That may have been the case. Uh, 
I had a lot of anecdotal stories, I still do. I still run into small business people who thank me for that policy for as long as it lasted because some of them we had, uh, I had one guy say, you know, I was able to buy some office equipment I was trying to buy. I was able to hire a person I couldn't hire. I mean, there's just a, generally there was a lot of conversation about the benefits of that package. Again, if we would have limited it and capped it at 100,000, probably been good. The governor called me after he became ambassador at large and said, you know, how long ago did we propose that we cap that 100? I said, two or three years ago. And you, know, you kind of go, well, maybe that would have made a real difference in the tax policy and the end result if we would have capped it there. That became, the, the small business part I, to me became the real lightning rod to the whole thing. Seemed to be you the know, most controversial that's, part. That's yeah. what we were reading about in the newspaper all the time. Okay, uh, before we get into your transition from, from Revenue Secretary to Department of Commerce, uh, I would point out that we worked together quite closely during many of these years uh, from uh, 2012 through, through 2016 uh, on the state's prestigious consensus revenue estimating yes. group. As you will recall, that body meets several times a year and is composed of economists and other experts in both the legislative and administrative branches of government, as well as university professors and key consultants. Uh, what are some of your memories of the consensus group as an institution and some of the challenges uh, we faced associated with revenue forecasting during a time of great many changes in both state and federal tax laws? That's a, uh, an extraordinarily interesting process to sit there at the table uh, with everybody around that table. Of course, a couple of economists from the universities and then legislative research and, and uh, revenue and all of us sitting around there trying to figure out what was going to happen uh, with revenues. Um, it's, it's a great process. Uh, I, it's one of those things where you probably don't always agree when you come out, but it is a consensus revenue estimating group, so consensus wins the day. I, the hardest thing for me was going to the cabinet meeting uh, the week after, two weeks after, and say, okay, uh, we're down again, and it doesn't look good. And uh, somebody's going to try to figure out what to do with the budget and all the things again. Uh, that, was, that was really a difficult time. Uh, to handle that, but it, it was what it was, and the consensus estimating group, I think, did probably the best job they could to try to get to the right numbers. Yeah. Okay, late in 2016, you leave as Secretary of Revenue when you are appointed as Chair of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors over at the Department of Commerce. Uh, eventually, in 2017, you would become the Secretary of Commerce. It occurs to me that in your positions over at Commerce, you were perhaps able to deal more directly with all things economic development, which of course was always your passion as, as we have discussed. Was leaving revenue to move to Commerce something you had sought out or was it something the governor had approached you about? Uh, the governor approached me. I think, it, uh, you know, we were making a change in the Secretary of Commerce. And again, I guess my economic development background, you go, okay, well, Nick maybe could handle this for a while. Uh, and so I went over to do it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the staff at Revenue. I enjoyed the staff at Commerce Department. Uh, really good professionals and good people to work with. But it did kind of fit my niche. It kind of fit a lot of things I've been working with. And I, and I really, really enjoyed my time over there. And we had some good things happen during that time. We had some good, good developments take place that I'm, I'm real pleased to have been a part of. Okay, uh, staying on economic development matters, by the time you had come back in with the Brownback administration in 2011, uh, there had been a few controversies building in the years since you had left the legislature involving oversight and even personnel matters at the Kansas Bioscience Authority, mm -hmm. and even the funding mechanism, which as you mentioned, it was sort of a tax increment finance concept, was becoming increasingly scrutinized. I do want to add here that Kenny Wilk and Ed McKechnie have said they believe that the KBA was absolutely a key partner of the broader team that successfully got the critical NCI cancer designation for the KU Med Center. So there certainly has, have been some important victories for the KBA and its, its economic development initiatives. Um, anyway, can, can you tell us what you must have thought from your perch over at Revenue when the decision was finally made to liquidate the KBA assets and shut it down. Um, were you at all disappointed that uh, maybe Governor Brownback and some of his then legislative allies may not have seemed as supportive of the biosciences programs as perhaps you and Representative Wilk and Governor Sebelius had been a decade earlier? Probably, uh, yeah, I'd say so. I agree with, uh, 
with Kenny and Ed, they, the Kansas, the OKU Cancer Center uh, probably would not be quite what it is today. I, I say that kind of tug in cheek because I, I don't know. It, it's a great, it's a great research and, and care center for cancer. There's no doubt about it. Dr. Hens, Jensen's a, a awesome leader of that. Uh, but I know that when the bioscience, we were going to meetings in Boston and around the country, um, and uh, I know I would be talking to others about the cancer center and getting a national designation, and everybody thought that would never happen in Kansas, that we'd never get a national designation for the cancer center. Uh, but yet, the people at KU and people here were saying, boy, uh, this bioscience initiative is probably going to be the thing that puts us over the top to get our national. And of course, they ended up with a national designation as a cancer center and have become really nationally known and renowned for, for their research and, and care that they give. Uh, MBAF is another uh, big, big get for the state of Kansas. And with the animal health corridor that was kind of already in the works, uh, but this just shot it through the roof. This was going to bring a lot of animal health companies to be headquarters close to NBAF mm -hmm. uh, from Manhattan to the Kansas City area, you, we would assume uh, and did assume at that time it would happen and, I, and it's still, still a big issue and still talked a lot about economic development, people's animal health corridor and so it's, it, both those were good, good results of the bioscience initiative. As far as it being done away with it, you know, I just wish we could have had a bit more discussions uh, about it uh, before, Kenny and I thought that 10, 15 years after it passed, it would need to be tweaked, it would need to be thought about, maybe privatized a little bit more uh, than it was. Um, and I wish we could have had those discussions, but we didn't and what happened happened and so we move on. Okay. Um, one more tax question, but before we get there, do you have any uh, unusual stories about some of your <laughs> most surprising days at work when you were a Secretary of Revenue? Yes, I was hoping. I was going to bring that up if you didn't. Um, sitting in my office one day, and all of a sudden, we had an Office of Special Investigations as a part of Revenue Department, and uh, one of the guys came running into my office and said, you got to call the Undersecretary down in Garden City um, now. Don't now. <laughs> I said, really? And, he said it in such a way that I called in the general counsel then because I figured something, something legal is going to be happening here. So we called the undersheriff down in, in the Garden City area and they said, uh, we have a district, our head district judge is being held hostage in his home by a man with a gun and a knife. And he's demanding that he talks to the Secretary of Revenue. Uh, so we need you to call the judge's home and carry on this conversation. So we called and we, um, it seemed like an hour, but it probably wasn't. We went back and forth. This guy wouldn't talk to us directly, talk through the judge to us. And we just talked forever. And finally he came up with some question about his past tax returns. And I think he, I, he never said this, but I think he's one of these people who don't think he ever knew, you don't need to pay taxes. It's not constitutional kind of thing. But anyway, he finally asked us a question. We said, okay, give us five minutes and we got to go look at your tax record to see if you're accurate or not. And we did and tax division gave us an answer in two minutes. Um, and we called back. By the time we called back, it had been resolved uh, and it wasn't. But never in my whole life did I think being Secretary of Revenue was now going to be a hostage negotiator. <laughs> of course, I went down to the court cases in Garden City and everything else and he's, he's now in prison. But uh, I never would have ex ever expected that to happen. There were a lot of things that probably I never expected to happen, but that's one thing I never expected to happen. High atop the list, yeah. okay. All right, before we leave tax talk aside, the third and final backfilling tax increase enacted in the wake of the original 2012 law occurred in 2017. Uh, at that time, lawmakers in both parties were openly complaining that the fiscal crisis had become ongoing and institutionalized and subsequently approved a bill that repealed the non-wage uh, business income exemption we, we've discussed and restored the three-bracket system that had been reduced to two. Um, although uh, Governor Brownback vetoed that measure, legislators ultimately overrode his veto with two-thirds majorities in both chambers. Watching all of this from the Department of Commerce, where you now were, did, uh, did the way all of that transpired in 2017 surprise you at all by that point? It really was, a, it just trailed on from the, all the 
work we've done and all the troubles we went through trying to make this thing right, uh, you just figured somewhere along the line it was going to it was going to have to come to some kind of conclusion, some kind of decision. Again, you know, I wish we could have talked about the cap on the small business and maybe talked about going back to some of the original intent of that tax policy with the formula and, you know, two rates and don't do anything unless you can afford to do it kind of mentality that was there in the beginning. I wish we could have done that, but, but we'd reached a point where, you know, I'm sure um, Sam, who replaced me at Revenue and everybody, were still tired about going into cabinet meetings and saying, uh, we we got to cut again, you know, and then the fights on the legislature to try to fund what they needed to fund was probably wearing everybody down pretty pretty heavy. So they came to that conclusion. Okay, uh, turning our attention back to a few final questions involving your 14 career uh, 14 year career here in the legislature, and given that you've already talked uh, a lot about some of the dynamics within the GOP caucus and and party. Can you tell us which Democrats you worked with the most often and which ones you thought may have been the most effective? Uh, you're asking me, um, I tried to work with all of them one way or another. Again, it's back to those, there's so many bills that aren't ideology. They aren't, you know, your principles or your philosophy. That sounds terrible. I mean, you always carry your principles through. But, you know, I, again, I've always had the attitude that, you can yell and scream at each other on the floor. You can debate as hard as you want to debate. You can debate to a sweat and just debate, debate, debate. Then go to lunch. Go have a cup of coffee. Talk for a bit. Um, again, relationships to me are extremely important. Um, and so I, I feel like I tried to do that with most anybody. Uh, again, I don't want to downplay. We had disagreements and we had some pretty hard disagreements on some issues. But again, I. I just wanted us to be able to work together if there was a day we could work together. Okay. Uh, I guess a similar ask about lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Which ones did you respect the most and maybe which ones did you dread uh, seeing the most coming into your office regardless of how effective they may have been? Feel free to name names. Uh, you know, I didn't, and I probably won't, <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, I always went back to uh, the value to me of lobbyists was obvious, was uh, to hear both sides of an issue from different perspectives. But I always felt like once I thought I knew where I wanted to stand, I stood. And uh, that eliminated a lot of people coming to my door is when you had a position. You know, at least half <laughs> were not gonna come by because they knew where you were at. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always tried to do that uh, serving here. And I've, I would recommend that to any legislator is try to find your position, make it an intelligent, make it that you really know what you're talking about and do it, because to me, the, the worst life in the legislature is saying, well, I don't know, well, I don't know, well, I don't know, because you're just going to get pounded not only by lobbyists, but fellow legislators sure. uh, for the next few days. So I, they all were good. You know, John Frederico, I will mention one name. John was a good, good guy, always helpful. I, I can go down the list probably. I probably shouldn't name names. There were a lot of them that were very helpful. There were some that, you know, I wish they wouldn't have come by my door. Uh, it was very tough, and we didn't agree on anything, and they kind of made that relationship a tough one, but, um, but most of them were, were pretty good. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm curious about the extent to which your perspective must have changed regarding the challenges faced by members of the cabinet from your days as a legislator to your days of fielding questions yourself standing at the committee podiums when you were secretary of both uh, revenue and commerce. Probably one of the hardest things to me was I was... Uh, facing a lot of my friends, uh, some of which may or may disagree with what I'm saying and what I'm presenting. Obviously, I'm there to represent the governor uh, on policy. Um, and um, so that's different than sitting here in a seat and I'm representing constituents, but now I'm representing the governor um, and going in and talking to people you've worked with for, for a long time. Um, it in some ways made it easier because we could talk uh, about an issue, but in other ways, it does put you in a little different position, uh, having to deal from that perspective yeah. rather than being one of the gang. You know? uh, during your days at Revenue and Commerce, who were some of the staff people in those agencies you found the most helpful to you? 
Well, you know, I, I'm going to give kudos to Steve Stodds for sure, uh, Richard Cram too, but Steve in particular uh, really, talking about developing that tax policy, Steve worked really hard to try to get that the way the governor wanted, but to be revenue neutral, as we used to always say. He, Steve just worked very, very hard to get there and try to make it a real good, intelligent plan that would be workable in the long run. And so I really appreciated Steve. Um, we had a couple people in DMV I really appreciated because we did go through a rough period in the DMV and they, they were very helpful in working through all of that. Commerce Department Bob North is mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, Bob's invaluable. I mean, he's just a, a gem over there in, in getting things done at the Department of Commerce. He's just an awesome person. I could name a bunch of people. We did a thing, I don't know if uh, the predecessor, she'll hear me saying this, did this, but uh, we did these brown bag lunches at Revenue Department. And I always found those really good because um, I didn't want to say anything. It wasn't a meeting where Nick was chairing with a gavel and this is the way it's going to be. What I wanted to do was hear from the employees of the department, uh, ideas, thoughts. What I particularly did, the only time I spoke was when I knew there was a rumor out there, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I would tell them, okay, this is a rumor and it's not true. It's not going to happen. Uh, and during the Brownback administration, a few times there was rumors about big cutbacks and things like that. And, you know, it's not going to happen, guys. So just spill the rumors and let's keep going, let's keep going you know. And, but I let them just present any problem they may have or any thoughts they had. And it was really helpful to do that. Okay. Uh, if, if I could make an observation, it has occurred to me that maybe you somehow belonged in a different and perhaps earlier generation of legislators than the one you served in. Uh, I always thought your strong suit was working with others, regardless of policy differences, to get things accomplished. So now that I've complimented you on this comes the trickier question to think about. Uh, given that you've been around the policymaking whirlwind in one form or another since the mid-90s, how would you compare and contrast the institutions of state government today, especially the legislature, with the way things were three decades ago? What are the biggest differences, and are those differences generally positive or negative in your mind? And please feel free to talk about anything you want, from changes in technology to increased political polarization to changing perceptions about the role of the public sector to the accelerating influence of powerful special interest groups. There, I, there are probably some differences. It seems like everything's gotten so much more personal than it used to be. Uh, it's not just issues anymore. It's it's a lot sometimes personality or, or they just get more personal than they than seem to me in the past to be. Um, I think social media probably lends a lot into some of what's going on with the personal attacks and the and the you know fighting back and forth. And you know for a long time I think there were some key issues that were hot issues. You know you, social issues which I'm. A social conservative on it used to be the real hot topics you know and and of course fiscal responsibility budgets were always hot to determine what to spend what not to spend uh, but now it seems like that's broadened to being a lot of different <laughs> issues almost every issue now becomes a hot issue on trying to resolve and it it kind of unfortunate because it's it kind of it it hurts the system in operating properly uh, it, it, DC is obviously a great example. They can't, they can't even hardly keep a speaker. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they're just, they're at each other's necks all the time. But I think that happens in state and local government too. You know, that it just doesn't work. Again, back to that proverb that's my favorite, is kindness and truth binding around you. If I favor is God, man. I think when you really start losing issues is when you use anger to try to win your, win your, your battle. Um, Kindness and then taking a stand is a real powerful, powerful way of operating to me, uh, better than anger. Um, and uh, so I think a lot of that's mixed into today's processes and systems, and it's, it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah. Well, please tell us about what you're doing now and anything else you want to add about what the future holds for you. Will you be involved in any capacity helping Republicans up and down the ballot this fall, or is it somewhat liberating to have a lot of that in, in your rearview mirror? <laughs> it's probably liberating having a, uh, my rearview mirror, but 
uh, as I think probably any person that's served, uh, I always use that Godfather example, you know, where Michael Colleone says, I tried to get out, but they just keep pulling me back in. <laughs> and that seems to happen. You know, it just seems that uh, people try to. And I, I, I appreciate that. One, if, if somebody's coming, if I've got anything to offer and advice on how to run or do anything, how to handle yourself, that's great. Uh, I've got a lot of people now uh, coming to me saying, can you help us with the upcoming elections, uh, particularly on the local level. And I'm happy, I'm happy to help where I can. Um, otherwise, I'm, I, I don't know what semi-retired, retired, but it seems like uh, there's projects that come along, there's uh, things to work on. Help, I've helped a friend with these business a little bit. Uh, some of those things have come along and, and I, you know, I'm more than happy. If something right comes along, I'm gonna grab it and run with it because I, I don't like sitting at home. I don't like uh, not having something to do, and, and I'd like to always have something where I might be making a difference of some kind. Okay. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity.